Hello, I'm Robert. Good to see everybody again. So for today's video, we are going to wrap up a series we've been working on. In fact, this is the fourth video in the series, and it's all about the age of the church. And what we've been looking at specifically are the first three chapters of Revelation. We're trying to cover those in depth. And in conjunction with that, we're trying to look at all the different timelines that impact the book of Revelation. There are timelines within the book of Revelation. There are timelines leading up to the book of Revelation. There are timelines about God's people. There's timelines about the enemy. And there's only one more that I know of that we haven't covered yet. And that is a timeline pertaining to the enemy kingdom, to the Roman Empire. So we're going to look at that next. Let's begin. So for the age of the church, this is what I'm calling chapter two. Uh, the first two videos we did were chapter one. The next two are chapter two. And what we looked at with our last video was an overview of chapter one, what I'm calling chapter one, not chapter one of the book of Revelation. Okay, chapter one of my series. Probably should have done things differently. Uh, with last or the last video we did, we looked at the seven churches from chapters two and three of Revelation. And we saw that those uh, seven letters from John had three distinct messages in each letter. We saw the exact same pattern get followed from one letter and one church to the next. One is that every letter was written to a contemporary church that was around when John was alive. Two, that same letter had both a, um, uh, an immediate purpose for the church was written to and a prophetic purpose for a future stage of God's church for God's people. And then lastly, the message to the overcomers was a, was a message for the last generation, for the last generation of Laodicea who will then transition into the time of the tribulation. And the message is their reward for overcoming. The last thing we're going to look at is we're going to review some of the timelines that we've seen so far, and we want to get into the last timeline for the Roman Empire. So both the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the enemy will reach their full stature during the tribulation. That's a point we've been making over and over again. The Bible details specific timelines for each, and we got one more to go. So in review, the Bible and Charles Dickens described the contest as a tale of two cities. Dickens wrote his book, A Tale of Two Cities. I believe he was a Christian. I don't know that for a fact, but I, if I remember right, he was. I don't think he was specifically trying to reference the book of Revelation, but that very famous first passage of his book just so perfectly and aptly describes the final battle between the people of God and the people of the enemy. And seeing it as a tale of two cities, that it seemed perfect because Revelation does talk about both kingdoms as being representative of cities. So the two cities are, or first of all, the word city is mentioned 24 times in the book of Revelation. The holy city describes both a symbolic, not literal place and a description of God's people on earth. The great city describes the enemy's kingdom on earth, both the literal earthly kingdom plus the world system that it champions. So first, the holy city, Jerusalem. This is going to be a little bit of review for us. And I will write on him the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. That's Revelation 3.12. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, Revelation 21, 2. So the other end of the book. And a little further on. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it. Clearly, the New Jerusalem is the holy city, and it's a description of God's people. Now, for the great city Babylon. This is from Revelation 17, 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. That's from Revelation 18, 10. 
in Revelation 18, 21, then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. All right, so clearly Revelation describes these two very different cities. Revelation describes the culmination of the battle between them. Daniel described the origin of the battle. So we've got the beginning in Daniel, the ending in Revelation. So a little reveal. Remember from Daniel's book, we looked at the king's dream in Daniel 2, 31 through 35, which was of a goal or of a statue. Daniel interprets his dream in 2, 36 through 45. The head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet mixed with clay. Finally, the stone. And these are four visions of four kingdoms. So in uh, Daniel 2, 31 through 35, we see four kingdoms plus Jesus. In Daniel 7, 1 through 14, we see four kings plus Jesus. It's showing the same four kingdoms of the enemy plus Jesus, just a little different description of them. Daniel 8, 1 through 14, this time we have two kingdoms plus the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, 1 and 2, we have four kingdoms seen as one beast. So just as the statue represents those four earthly kingdoms, which we remember as Babylon, Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and lastly, the Roman Empire. So the statue sees those four as one continuum, one entity. And in Revelation, we see them as one beast, all four kingdoms in one beast. So the interpretation, we already went over it. The head of gold is in a lion is Daniel, or is Babylon from Daniel 2.38. The breast and arms of silver and the bear are the Medes and Persians, Daniel 8.20. Thighs of bronze and the leopard is Greece uh, from Daniel 8.21. And legs of iron and feet mixed with clay, different than others, is Rome. So where it's talking about the animals, that was also in Daniel chapter 8. And we see it again in Revelation chapter 13. So in one instance, those four kingdoms are seen as one statue. And in another instance, they're seen as four beasts coming up out of the sea. And in Revelation, they're seen as one beast together. Okay, So all the enemy's kingdoms and all its different manifestations, it really comes back to Lucifer was calling the shots. It was his kingdom on earth to do what he wanted to. And then the stone, very consistently, that's always Jesus who's just going to crush all of them. Good for us. So the four visions is one body of information. They are the same historical events. Each vision gives different details of the same historical events, whether it's the four animals or the statue with four parts to it. Same historical events, same kingdom. Both Daniel and Revelation view the statue and the four beasts as one entity, one earthly kingdom of the enemy in four different stages. Both Daniel and Revelation portray Jesus as overcoming the enemy kingdom. So the church versus Rome, this is the, the practical application of this. Jesus was born during the reign of the first Caesar, Augustus. So the Roman Empire who is the sworn enemy of the kingdom of God, as seen in Daniel at its very beginning during the life or during the birth of Jesus. So both the church and the Roman Empire had the exact same beginning time. The church started with one man, Jesus, while Rome was the dominant empire on the planet. God delights in putting one hand behind his back and saying, I'm going to beat you anyway. And usually it's two hands behind his back and says, I'm still going to whoop you. And this is what he's doing here also. So the church is the stone cut out of the mountain. Rome is the iron that crushes and shatters all things. 
So if this message is accurate, and message meaning the interpretation that I'm showing. So the message here is the one I'm giving. So if what I'm saying is accurate as an interpretation of scripture, then we are on the doorstep of the beginning of the tribulation, the final tale of two cities. And that's not just what I'm sharing in this particular video, but it's the culmination of all of the others. And if what I'm saying is accurate, then scripture should give an accurate picture of current world events that portray the status of each city prior to the beginning of the tribulation. So in other words, if we really are on the doorstep of the last great period of history, the great tribulation, then there will be events that show that we are close. And we've looked at those for the church already. So the birth pains. After many days, you will be summoned in the latter years. You will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which, is, which had been a continual waste. But its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. That's from Ezekiel 38.8. So Ezekiel is prophesying that not only would Israel be destroyed, but then it will be uh, reborn. It will, it will reappear again. And of course, at that point, Israel was a living nation. It hadn't been destroyed. We know historically now that for 1,900 years, there was no Israel. And Ezekiel is uh, foretelling all of that. Why is this important to us? Because in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was asked specifically by the apostles to tell them what is it going to look like prior to your second coming. Prior to your return, when Jesus described these things called the birth pains. These things have to happen or will happen in order for me to come back. Well, the return of Israel was likewise one of those birth pains because Israel appears many times in the book of Revelation. So if Israel is there at the end of the time, it had to become a nation again. And in fact, it did happen. And scripture tells us that the people who saw that happen, that until the last, before the last one dies of that generation, Jesus will come back. So right now, we're on the clock, and it's been 75 years since Israel was restored as a nation. All right, second thing, two days time, Hosea 2.2 2 says, he will revive us after two days, he will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So this was a prophecy from Hosea about the resurrection of Jesus. It pertains to his first resurrection. But based upon Peter's verse, or Peter's uh, scripture, which says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, means that this uh, word from Hosea also applies to his second coming. In other words, you would say he will revive us after 2,000 years because the day is as 1,000 years. So it's been roughly 2,000 years since Jesus left the earth the first time. That would be in the year 33. So again, that timeline is getting pinned down to now being uh, that we should be looking for the return of Jesus. All right, and then Daniel's timeline uh, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city, Daniel 9.24. So remember, that was a timeline that began with the book of Daniel, and it started when a decree was made by Cyrus telling God's people to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So once that timeline started, the clock was ticking. 69 weeks, a week being seven years, 69 weeks times seven, I can't remember the number, but it took us right to the year 26. Jesus, so therefore, that seventh year, um, within that time, Jesus had to begin his ministry. Okay, because we couldn't cross over into a 71st year. It's the year 34. If events hadn't taken place that were prophesied, we would have had that happen. So, 70th week, the last week is the three and a half years of Christ's first coming, plus the three and a half years of the tribulation. Taken together, that's seven years. In the middle are 2,000 years okay, of church history. And that's what 
the letters from John to the seven churches describes. It describes those 2,000 years of church history. So all of these things end up telling us that the time of Christ's return should be upon us. It should be coming very quickly. So Revelation is the culmination of the tale of two cities. The different versions of the demonic kingdom through history are biblically viewed as one entity. And the birth pangs, Daniel's timeline in two days, all tell us that the return of Jesus should be very soon. So we're going to look at the next timeline. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, today, if this interpretation of scripture is accurate, then it portrays the return of Jesus, not just as a future event or one that could possibly happen in our lifetime or even in the next few decades, but rather in a few years. If this interpretation of scripture pertaining to the church is accurate, then scripture will likewise reveal the current status of the Roman Empire and place its completion within the next few years as well. Because those two timelines of God's people and the enemy's people, they parallel one another and they both have the same end point. So they're proceeding, they're growing, they're changing at roughly the same pace. And both should be preparation for the beginning of the tribulation. One will see the rise or the return of Jesus. One will see the rise of the Antichrist. Both kingdoms are getting ready for that event. All right, Revelation 17, 9 through 11. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is. The other has not yet come, and when comes he must remain a little while the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction this is revelation 17 9 through 11. this is the timeline that we're referencing for the roman empire okay now we need to break it down and see what is the mystery what is the answer to to what this is saying so first of all, let's look at this phrase. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, and it was a city famously built upon seven mountains. So we know that Rome is being referenced here. This passage is about Rome, and it's about the Roman Empire. Next section. And they are seven kings, five had fallen, five have fallen, one is. The other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an ape and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. So we know it's the Roman Empire being talked about. We know that prophetically, the timeline of the empire is being described as the reigns of eight kings. So we need to see what does that mean. All right, first off, and they are seven kings, five had fallen, have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. Let's look at that first. These verses represent a timeline, pro timeline of prophecy similar to those in Revelation 1, 19, 20, and to the seven churches, meaning it follows a pattern of past, present, and future. So if you look, have, is, yet, past, present, future. Five, have fallen in the past. One is, one is now, is present, and the other has not yet come. That would be the seventh. So the prophecy follows a pattern of past, present, future, or we can look at it as beginning, middle, and end. One or have is past, is is present, and yet is future. All forms of the verb be. So it says, and they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. So first of all, let's look at the past. Five have fallen. So the fulcrum, 
around which all this depends. Okay, the point in time that is our sticking point, which we can begin to build upon to understand this timeline, is when John wrote the message of the book of Revelation. He did that in the year 96. So 96 is our sticking point. So when we're talking about past, it would be before that. When we're talking about present, it would include the year 96. When we're talking about future, it would be farther down the road to this side of 96. So by that time, when John wrote this, the original five Caesars had all ruled and passed away or fallen. Now, what's significant about those five is that they are called the Julio Claudian dynasty. It was Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. They reigned from 27 BC to 68 AD. Why are they significant? Those five are what's considered the founding dynasty. They all were um, connected by a bloodline, by name. After Nero died, it was a new dynasty that took over. So it's not connected to them. Those first five had all fallen by the time that John wrote this. Now, we need to look at present. One is. So... The Julio Claudian dynasty ended in 68 AD. John wrote Revelation in 96 AD. So, in regards to the prophecy, past, present, future, he was writing during the present. And the word is represents the present tense of the verb be. When John wrote letters to the seven churches and to their angels, the things which are, they were considered to be one timeline, one week. Remember Daniel's week, okay? That timeline, that time of the churches was part of the one week. It was one period of time. So when John is saying one, it's actually representing a long span of history. So this was the present tense R. That's the passage about the angels. It was the middle section of the prophecy representing 2,000 years of church history. So Revelation 17, 9 through 11, the one is, represents a singular, similarly long time frame from the end of the Julio Claudian dynasty to the final Caesar of the Roman Empire, approximately 2,000 years. Okay, so that would take us to the sixth king, or through the sixth king. So... See how the two timelines very much parallel each other. And lastly, the other has not yet come. So we're talking about the future king. So the other has not yet come represents the future, not part of the one is group of leaders, which collectively represents the sixth king. So we know historically speaking, over the course of 2,000 years, many, many, many people have been called Caesar or the head of the Roman Empire. So the other has not yet come. That's the last king. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. So five original kings. Then we have this long span of time that's represented as one king. So that's the sixth. Okay, now we're talking about the beast. So this is going to be the Antichrist. He is the seventh, but it says he's also the eighth. So when the Antichrist arises, he is seen as the end uh, or the, the king that puts an end to that long 2,000 year history of the middle term of one is. He's not part of one is. Okay. The eighth king goes to, to destruction, so he is the last king. The eighth king is also the seventh king. So we have to ask, how does that work? So the seventh king remains or reigns a little while until he becomes the eighth king. So how can the seventh and eighth kings be the same person? Well, scripture will give us the answer because it always does says the beast which was and is not is describing that seventh slash eighth king. So the seventh slash eighth king is called the beast which was and is not. 
This refers to an earlier passage in Revelation about the beast from the sea, who is the Antichrist. It says, the beast which was and is not. Revelation 17, 9 through 11. It says, then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. So there's those seven heads again. Um, later on it says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. So the head is a king. The king dies, but that fatal wound was healed. He gets resurrected. He dies and gets resurrected. Okay. Remember, the seven heads are seven kings. Those are the seven kings that we're talking about in that timeline in Revelation chapter 17. And in Revelation uh, 13, 1 through 3, it reaffirms this. It says, I saw one of his heads. This is referencing the beast from the sea as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Revelation 13, 11, and 12. And now it's talking about the beast from the earth. He makes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast. That's the beast from the sea, the Antichrist. The false prophet gets the rest of the earth to worship the Antichrist. And it says that the Antichrist or the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Okay. So again, fatal means he died. He died, but he gets resurrected and then he gets worshipped. So clearly he's alive again. That's how the seventh king can also be the eighth king, okay? Seventh king dies, gets resurrected. When he returns, he's the eighth king. The beast was the seventh king. Then he died, is not. Then is resurrected to be the eighth king, whose fatal wound is healed. The last king of the Roman Empire will die and be resurrected. This will mark his transition to being the eighth and final king, which goes to destruction. When this world leader dies and is resurrected, he will become the Antichrist, and this will mark the beginning of the tribulation. So, again, let's put together the timeline. The five original Caesars of the Roman Empire, the Julio Claudian dynasty, right? They all died and passed away before John wrote the book of Revelation. John existed during the middle section, okay, one is, present tense, present time. And that time frame is used to describe one king. Even though we know physically, historically, many kings reign, the Bible is describing that as one king, one time frame. Now, when the Antichrist comes, he will be seen as a seventh king. When the Antichrist dies and gets resurrected, he comes back as the Antichrist. And when he gets resurrected, that's when the tribulation begins. Okay? Five kings have died, Julio Claudian dynasty. One long time period in the middle. Then the last king comes, and he's going to die. When he gets resurrected, the tribulation begins, and he will be an eighth king, the Antichrist. So, we've already looked at this, but I figure it's a good idea to revisit this. Remember the picture of the first Caesar? And could this be the picture of the last Caesar? We're talking about the Roman Empire, so there's Julius Caesar. Oh, remember we talked about how the current day Roman Empire was actually Russia, that Russia inherited the Roman Empire. Amazing the similarity between how they look. And clearly, I'm not the only one who thinks that because this is on the internet, so other people see this too. I'm putting it together again. So, what have we learned? The Roman Empire is the enemy of the church. We know that from the book of Daniel. We also know it's alive and well today. We put that together before. There was the first version of the Roman Empire. It transitioned to the Byzantine Empire. When the Byzantine Empire collapsed, it immediately transitioned to the Russian Empire. Okay? But it's all just three different versions of the Roman Empire. Okay? And certainly Russia is still around today, very much so. The Antichrist will be the last leader of the Roman Empire. 
meaning that in our world, it's going to have to be the leader of Russia. And the current leader is Vladimir Putin. And all the other signs we've looked at from the church seem to say that right now is the time that is the signs of the time showing that Jesus is going to come back. Remember that the two timelines of God's people and the enemy's people need to parallel. So are they paralleling? We have to determine that. Well, I, I hope that this has been eye-opening. I Again, I've said it many times before, I'm just doing my best to be God's vessel to use, to speak through. If I'm deceived, then you need to determine that. If I am actually sharing uh, God's truth, you need to determine that as well. Because if this is the time of the end, if this is the time that is seeing the return of Jesus, God's people need to be on the alert. Excuse me. And the rest of the book of Revelation that we're going to look at is going to continue to reveal the mysteries that we need to know, that we need to understand so that we can survive till the end. Because we're, if, if this is that time, if we are going to see the, uh, the Antichrist arise, then we're going to meet one of two fates. We're going to lose our life in martyrdom or... We're going to be resur or we're going to be raptured in the clouds to meet Jesus. Either way, we have to persevere to one end or the other. We cannot give up our faith in Jesus. We cannot deny that He is the Son of God. We cannot deny that we are His children. And that's why the Book of Revelation is so vital to us right now. I hope you'll continue this journey with me. I'm looking forward to the next chapter. What we're going to look at which is going to be God's people, the last generation. God bless. I look forward to doing this again.